three um, contributors. The first one will be um, Robert Kahn, to my right. As you know, um, Bob, as we say, is one of the uh, major promoter, creator, father of the internet, in particular TCP IP, but he has also, while he was in the uh, ARPA, Department of Defense in the United States, for many years he's been uh, babysitting the internet, but now he is uh, presently uh, a delegate for the use of uh, usages of the internet within the Ministry of uh, Research. And what? In France. In France? Yeah, in <laughs> France, yeah, of course. Sorry, he's French, so he's the French, French Ministry, <laughs> right. <laughs> and then uh, to my far right, we have the third uh, contributor, which, who is Francis Muguet. He's also a Frenchman. He doesn't work uh, for a ministry, he is a researcher. Uh, he is working in a, in a laboratory called uh, Ecole Nationale de Supérieure des Techniques Avancées, and he's been involved for some time in the Internet of Things and various aspects of the Internet. So I'll uh, give the floor to Bob Kahn, please. Okay. Can, are the microphones on sufficient? That, can you hear in the back? Okay. Thank you very much. Um, as uh, Louis Pouzan mentioned, I'm Bob Kahn. I'm president of uh, CNRI, which is a nonprofit research organization in the United States. And I was asked to talk about the, um, the use of a particular technology that uh, we have developed. Uh, it's now probably 15 years old. It's been on the internet for a decade and it's rather 7x24 bulletproof and reliable. Widely used in the publishing industry, uh, widely used uh, for many applications that involve access to content. Um, it's got direct application to the internet itself. Um, but we haven't really pushed that because it would be required to take the whole internet to the next level in order to do that. I, I still hope that will happen. I want to focus on its use in, in sort of managing the equivalent of content, in this case, how it might apply to the internet of things. And when we talk about uh, an internet of things, um, you know, every one of you will have your own notion of what that is. Um, but to me, it's almost irrelevant how you define it. The bottom line is for a resolution system, an identifier system to make sense, ultimately you have to translate these identifiers into meaningful information about the thing that you're identifying. Now that thing could be a digital thing in its own right, in which case you may want to be able to access the digital thing. But the thing might be a physical object, in which case you might want to just learn about attributes of that physical object or a manifestation of that physical object uh, in the network environment. The system that we built for doing this kind of resolution is called the handle system, handle being equivalent to uh, the word identifier, if you like. Uh, and I, what I was asked to do is to give you a, an overview, a sense of what this system is, how it works, see if I can explain the power of it, uh, and uh, then we'll have an open discussion, I guess, about how it might relate to the Internet of Things. There are only two slides that I have about the things, so the rest of it is going to be about the technology and how it works. I have some very lengthy presentations. I tried to collapse it um, into a small set of slides, but I found I, I, I needed a certain number of them just to give you kind of a graphic interpretation of it, so that's what I, I will try to do. So let me begin by talking about why identifiers are important. Uh, so there are a variety of reasons. One reason it might be important and what motivated me was being able to manage information on the network over very long periods of time, and by long I mean if you put an electronic journal on the shelf, you might want to take it off a century later and still have all the identifiers work. Um, you may want to use it to deal with very large amounts of information on the net. Uh, you may deal with information which itself is moving on the net. And in the Internet of Things, 
what's moving might be the manifestations of these things on the net as versus the things themselves. In many of the applications, things that become critically of interest are protecting rights, interests, and value. So whether it's copyrighted material and it's under rights, or whether it's you know, contractual things and it's under interests, or it's digital cash and it's under value, they are all important. Um, now, a little bit about the context of all of this. Uh, as far as you know, the development of the system, I was assuming that we would be in a world eventually of different information systems, dynamic formatting, data typing, where all these systems needed to be interoperable and they may change over time, different platforms, different vendors, and different philosophies of operation even. And the objects themselves that are in the system can be mobile. So that's the basic notion. And the handle system was one component of a kind of a larger architectural notion that I had been developing called the digital object architecture, which was an attempt to rethink what the internet would look like if the main goal was to manage information and to allow you to access it over long periods of time and to create it, publish it, and make it available. So in some sense, you might ask the question, well, how does this compare with something like the World Wide Web? I would simply say that's another example of an application intended to make information available and to help create it, but it isn't one that was necessarily designed so that you could understand what you could do with the information, manage it over long terms, and so forth. So the architecture itself really had just a few components. One is the idea of a client. The way the client finds out about things is it gets into a resource discovery mode. Today you would know about that in terms of maybe search engines which find things by crawling the net. In this case, they would find things through metadata registries which were crafted either by systems or by the individuals. Um, and they would return the identifiers of the things that you were looking for. So this is the way you apply semantics through these metadata registries. What it will produce are these identifiers. Well, if you want to then take the next step, you need to go into a resolution system to resolve those identifiers. What you get back is state information about the thing you've identified. And at that point, you go into what we call repositories where collections of these objects exist to try and access them. So that's the that's the essence of the architecture in a nutshell. If I were to describe the internet in a similar cartoon-like scenario, I would show you only a handful of nets, routers between them, which we called gateways originally, and some end-to-end -end protocols, and I'd leave it at that. So that's the equivalent. Now, the simplest picture I can give you of how this works on the resolution side is this one over here. You give it an identifier into the resolution system. It's shown as a little box here. That box is actually a very complicated system, and I'm not going to try and explain the intricacies of it, other than to say it's a very distributed system, it's worldwide, it's got different levels, every organization can manage its own identifiers. You can not only manage your own, but you, you have the management tools built into the system to enable you to do that. You don't have to rely on an external party. If you look at the www.handle.net site, you can find all about the details of it, and you can download the software uh, for which there's no charge. It's all in the public, uh, uh, public space. So this is a system which, if you provide an identifier in very quick terms, like fraction of a second, you will get back a little handle record that gives you state information about the thing that you've identified. It might say where it's located on the net, might be in many places on the net. It might give you uh, information like public keys. It might give you authentication information and so forth. So you give it this identifier. We call it a handle. You get back a handle record. And many parties around the world who are using this system have actually branded these handles. So they've given it their own name. So the publishing community has branded their use of handles, a digital object identifier in acronym form, a DOI. So this is a non-nodal system. It's not a box in a place. It's many servers all distributed around the world. It's very scalable. We believe that it's got no intrinsic limit on the number of identifiers that it can deal with. Uh, it supports both global resolution and local resolution. You can maintain your own identifiers. And there's been a lot of effort built into making the system highly reliable uh, with mirroring for efficiency and uh, I'll give you some examples of that uh, in, in a few minutes.
So if I were gonna give you the big picture of what the handle system looked like, this is what it would look like. I'm, I'm not gonna try and explain this, but I wanna show you some of the complexity that's there. So it's a collection of handle services. Here you see five of them on that chart. One of them is called the Global Handle Registry. Um, and this is, in, a, in this particular instance, the Global Handle Registry is itself a distributed scalable system and we're working toward a mode in which the actual control of that system is distributed among many parties around the world. And then you've got a series of local handle services. These are ones that individual organizations or people might run themselves. And you can have an arbitrary number of local handle services. None of those are boxes either. So a typical local handle service might consist of a lot of different sites. So this could be a company that's got 20 offices around the globe and every office could be part of the single service and it all becomes a single coherent logical thing. Now one service might have, and you see in this picture, N sites, another service might have two sites, and every one of those sites can consist of a number of processors or servers. So here you see a local handle service consisting of N sites, and site number one has N machines, and site number N has two machines, and so forth. This is what a handle record looks like conceptually. The handle is something that's got a prefix, a slash, and a suffix. If you see 10.123 slash 456 is the handle. The, the thing on the right-hand side of the slash can be anything you like. So you, if you have any existing identifier system, whether it's date time stamps, cryptographic strings, semantics, anything you're currently using, ISBN numbers, uh, license plate numbers, whatever, you can continue to use it. The part to the left of the slash, the prefix, simply identifies the organizational entity that has control over the identifiers created with that prefix. And it's all controlled under a public key infrastructure that's built into the system. So when you bring up this system, it creates a public-private key pair. You keep the private part, you let the system know what the public part is, the system never sees the private part, and then you can control everything about this with the public-private key pair. If you lose your private key for whatever reason, uh, the only party that will be affected is yourself. It will not affect any other party that's making use of the system. So here's a case where this handle record has uh, five entries, one of which is an administrative record. Um, every one of the entries, just like with the digital objects, are data typed. So you could come in and say, give me the URLs associated with this identifier, and you see that it's got two of them. Um, that's what the second field here, the index might you know, enumerate them. You might say, give me the second one or the third one if it exists, and so forth. The third entry might be something like a repository access protocol, which says that's a protocol you need to use to access the repository whose identifier is on the right. Uh, this next one would be who administers, and you can create your own protocol things, put them in the system, uh, and the system will be automatically uh, available to anybody who wants to make use of it. Now this is what you get out of the global system when you bring up a client. It will come back and it'll say, this particular um, uh, system has a primary site consisting of two servers, it's got a secondary site that will do resolving. Secondary site has three servers, the primary site has two, and there's a second secondary site that has one server. It will tell you the IP addresses, give you ports, public keys so you can authenticate. Everything in the system has full security and it's had it for more than a decade. So even though there's been a big push for DNSSEC, this is the kind of system that uh, has all the security built into it based on a public key infrastructure. So let's say the user decides it wants to do the resolution out of secondary site A, and the system picks server C because maybe it's the nearest one or the fastest one, so it understands what it needs to then authenticate what it gets back. So here's a client that you see up in the corner. That client makes a request of server three on secondary site A, uh, so it provides a certain identifier there. Back comes back the handle data directly. Now, if what you have is a web client that knows nothing about handle data. There is a whole distributed system around the globe to support legacy web clients. And so 
these, these proxy servers basically take HTTP GET requests from a web browser. That series of proxy servers is identified with a single domain name. It's interesting that one domain name can get you all of them, which are guaranteed to be able to get into the handle system. So you don't ever get the kind of disconnect where a domain server will tell you to go to one place and then that place either can't be, re can't be reached or doesn't have the ability to get into the handle system for connectivity reasons. This will be guaranteed to work. That proxy server strips off the handles because the URL contains the handle in it, resolves the handle, pulls back the handle data, strips out a URL, and gives it back to the web browser with a redirect and goes and gets the data. So that's an example of what it might look like. HDL.handle.net is the one that we, the series of proxy servers that we run. Uh, the publishers run a subset of that called dx.doi.org. But if you publish it as URLs, you'll guarantee it will continue to work, but it'll also work directly with the handles. You can also download the client plugin. So if you have an application, you can put a, a plugin that will directly go and do the resolution and pull back the handle data. Um, so on the administration side, this is used for creating handles, for updating handles, for deleting handles, for changing entries in handles as you move <laughs> objects around. Uh, and that can all be done through, you know, a web server into the system or, or directly. So there is actually a uh, custom client that you could put in which will do it and you can do handle resolution embedded in, in another process. So it's all pretty powerful. All of the software is on the net. You can download it. It is open source. Um, do whatever you like with it. Uh, but if you want to make use of this, you have to actually register into the system to get a prefix so that your use of identifiers doesn't collide with somebody else's use of identifiers. And uh, it's in fairly widespread use. Currently, we have uh, on the order of a billion objects identified in the handle system. Publishers alone identify something on the order of 35 million. These are things that, these are digital objects that they're willing to transact business on. Um, now, let me just say a little bit about the Internet of Things, and I'm going to leave it to the other speakers to talk about this subject in more detail. I just wanted to show you how resolution could fit into this picture. Um, so I'm assuming that things in the Internet of Things refer to physical objects or could even be conceptual entities of one sort or another, that these things have a digital presence on the Internet, and their presence at a minimum is in the form of state information. That state information may in fact take you to other things that that are related to it, that have manifestations of it. So um, if, let's say, the identifier was an identifier for an individual, maybe all you want to know is their contact information uh, or their public key or something that you could use to validate them as an individual. But maybe you want other things that are related to them, like a, an image of that person or uh, more, more details about them. And so you might go to digital objects that, that are specific to that uh, that thing. Um, so within the handle system, that's where the identifier resolves to the state information. We don't define what it is. The handle system allows the user to define what that state information is. And you put it in in the form of type value pairs. And so um, if, for example, to take the case of the individual you want to put in where that individual can be contacted today, you'd have a field that would would say that that's what it is, and in fact, every type field can be resolved within the handle system to understand what the type value actually means. In an RFID system, which is one that's gotten very prevalent for identifying certain physical objects, although it can be more broadly applied, uh, what I would have liked to see is the RFID tags actually have the handles in them directly so that when you did an interrogation of an RFID tag, what you get is the identifier for the state information for that. At the moment, the way that's actually implemented in, in, in some in implementations through the use of the DNS, you actually end up with separate identifiers that often don't go into the actual metadata that's available on the network itself. So you actually are creating a separate kind of set of identifiers for things that may already be identified on the net a different way. To give you one specific example, 
let me show you in this next chart here. Um, here's a case where, uh, let's say, the publishing industry has a very large metadata registry for all of the objects that they're willing to transact business on. Well, let's say a typical book would now like to be on the bookshelf and have an RFID tag embedded in it. What is the identifier that goes into that tag? Well, if that identifier is kind of a standard barcode-like representation in an RFID tag, then you've got several levels of translation of that identifier before you actually figure out what the metadata really is. In principle, if that RFID tag for the book was defined by the publishers to actually have the identifier of the book that they already gave it, it could go directly into the system and pull out the relevant information. So some of the relevant information might actually be in the handle system directly, like um, the price of the book, if they wanted to publish it that way, or the authentication information for the book, or things like that. Uh, where you might want more metadata uh, that is contained in a large metadata registry, and the largest of those registries today is run by an organization uh, located in the Boston area uh, from the Publishers, Inter Publishers Interlinking Association. It's called Crossref, and they've got a huge database. They work with virtually every publisher around the globe, and they create the metadata for those objects, put it in that repository, that, that registry, really, and it would be very efficient if the books that got on the shelf, even the journals, had the RFID tags literally with those identifiers in them. Doesn't look like it's going that way for a variety of reasons. I think that's unfortunate. I think that's actually a, a mistake that's going to have to be corrected. But the, given the fact that it's got separate identifiers, if you look at this next chart, in the, in the top version, if the reader read a, a, the RFID tag and pulled out a handle, it could use the handle system to either resolve it right there or go into the existing metadata registry and do the resolution there. If, in fact, you've got a specific set of other RFID identifiers, then what's going to happen is the reader will pull back whatever the identifier is that was embedded in that RFID tag, it will go into an alternative registry, and that registry is probably now going to have to be configured to figure out how to get into the other registry that's got that information. And you end up with a, you know, a proliferation of either multiple copies of the same registry or a very complex uh, interoperability issue between different metadata registries. So I think there's a real issue here that needs to be addressed. I believe the handle system is a, is a good choice for dealing with this problem, but we're already down a path that looks like it's going to create some incompatibilities, and I think the sooner that we recognize the importance of this problem and try and deal with it, the better we all will be going forward. So thank you very much for your attention, and I look forward to the question and answer session later. Okay, thank you. All right. Thank you, Bob, very much. Now, uh, I suppose there might be immediate questions that some people in the audience would like to ask Bob, and just to make sure you can uh, you can interpret correctly what uh, he has been presenting. Pavel Tuma, CZNIC. Uh, I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Uh, my name is Pavel Tuma uh, from CZNIC. Uh, I've got a question. Can you outline the basic differences or the advantages, pluses, minuses uh, between handle system and DNS? Because uh, I can see from your presentation that's uh, mainly, uh, in my opinion, about uh, the structure of the data uh, which uh, are related to the identifiers. That's first question. And the second question is uh, whether uh, there is uh, some structuring in the handle system uh, uh, like in DNS, where we have CCTLDs and GTLDs, uh, so the user uh, might uh, get the idea uh, what uh, what uh, the identifier describes. So if uh, there is the domain with .cz, uh, probably uh, it will be some resource in Czech Republic. Uh, but uh, if there is .com, uh, we can assume that it's in the United States, for example. Well, let, let, me, let me start with the second part. Um, if you think about a memory chip, that you might buy from Intel or any other company that sells it, uh, they work very hard to simply say you put the bits in, get the bits out, and 
nothing inside that system is going to try and, and interpret it, uh, understand semantics or anything. It's just a set of bits that you put on the chip and get back out. And that's the intent here. There, there is no uh, intent to try and do anything more than take what you as the user put in and provide it back to the end user. So if you want to put in uh, something in there and just simply say it's an IP address, IPv4 address, and that's all you want to tell them about it, that's all they're going to find out. And there, there is no other semantic interpretation other than what you choose to put into that system. Now, one might ask, what's an IPv4 address? And you can also resolve that kind of type, the type that says it's an IPv4 address, to tell them whatever you think is relevant for them to know about it, like here's a description in English or German or whatever language you want. Uh, here is a, um, a program that might be used to the manifest uh, that, or it might say for a URL, use the web browser, whatever your, your choice is. So, let me just leave it at that. There's really intended to be no, uh, nothing more um, complicated than you would get from a memory chip. What you put in is what you get back out. Um, and the system doesn't, the only thing the system does is say that the party who controls that identifier is the one that controls what goes in. On the, the other question you asked had to do with uh, the relationship between this and the DNS. And this is actually, in some ways, a very simple question and in some ways a very complicated question. In, in the simple answer, uh, the DNS is a resolution system. And you give it uh, the equivalent of a domain name. It will produce back, typically what you want is the IP address, but you can also get some uh, you know, uh, naming authority information as well. The handle system has, not only can do that, we actually have in the past, with the help of an organization that used to have virtually the entire uh, non-country code database, uh, uh, ported the entire DNS onto the handle system. So we know that you can go into the handle system either with the regular handle protocol or through the bind software through the normal port 53, which is where it works, and you can actually get the total equivalent of the DNS. Now, people would have to know to go to that particular system, so you have to rehome it on that one, but it can provide exactly the same functionality on a much more uh, effective resolution base because it's got built-in security, it's got the ability to deal with uh, multiple locations on the net, not just one, it's got the ability to deal with uh, uh, public keys for certain authentication activities. You can, you can do an, a lot more within that base. However, the DNS is very widely distributed today. It's embedded in so many different implementations that um, trying to change that in such a way that you could take advantage of all of that capability is really a daunting challenge it becomes an incredible legacy system problem to try and do that. My belief is that if you have a handle system out there, whether it's got DNS information in it or not, it provides a great opportunity for doing new applications that want more information back from the resolution system than you can get from DNS and the kind of information that you yourself would be interested in putting in to the things that you want to make available on the net. So. If you separate those two out, it's clear opportunity for anybody who wants to make use of this capability to do it with their new applications and to build the applications with all the client capability of just going directly into the handle system for resolution. If you want it to deal with all the things that are currently DNS, you have to be prepared to deal with so many intricacies that I don't think I could even tell you what they all are in a very short talk that has to do with getting things home properly, interpreting things. Uh, one of the nice things about the handle system is it's all based on UTF-8 encoding, so all the internationalized thing comes for free. But if you're, again, trying to make use of existing DNS space to try and do that, there are a whole variety of issues, as, you know, and not the least of which is, is everything in the handle system, and can you really go there when, and know that it will resolve properly, or is some of it still in the DNS, and you, 
you must go there, and which do you go one way or another? You get all those set of choices as well. So for those reasons, I haven't really been pushing the handle system as a DNS replacement. I have basically said to people who are interested in this, consider porting the DNS onto the handle system, and but still maintaining the DNS the way it is for those people who need the DNS as a legacy environment. It's in fact the current environment. And uh, we'll see how that goes. It, it's, it's really a good choice, but I don't know if people will make it. Thank you, Bob. I think we, we have a debate with the various uh, contributors. Now, the next, uh, uh, next presentation will be by Bernard Benamou, who I'm already introduced, mainly on privacy, I guess. All right, go ahead. Thanks, and uh, I, will, I will try to express uh, some views about the Internet of Things without the help or the, the curse, it depends, uh, of a, a PowerPoint presentation. Uh, let's, let's try to, to go back to its connectivity, to expand its function, to expand the, 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 the magnificent work that my uh, neighbor at the right has been creating by creating the network as it is today. The question is, do we want the Internet in the future to look like on the basic principles what it is today? Or do we take the risk to have an Internet in the future that will be based on another logic, another architecture than the current Internet? That's the basic issue. And one of the key issues that could orient or reorient um, the, the way the Internet will be built is privacy. Because obviously what we describe is an Internet which uh, blend or which mixes three key technologies. RFID has been uh, often quoted, but Another one which is essential for the development of the Internet of Things is mobile technology. Uh, and the entire spectrum of technologies using, using radio spectrum uh, to connect people or to connect people or their devices to the RFID chips. And most of them are becoming mainstream. Let's go back to the figures. Uh, at this moment, we agree on the fact that there are 1.5 billion users of the Internet on the planet. For 3.8, some people say 4 billion, uh, mobile telephone users on the planet. Basically, most of them in the five years, most of them, it's maybe, um, it, will, it will take a, a few years, but the majority of them will be soon connected via the telephone, their mobile phone, to the Internet. So the, the landscape of the usage, but also the landscape of the technologies, is changing rapidly. We all have seen that the, telef the mobile phone, which were existing for a long time, and mobile phone called the smartphone, which was existing for at least 10 years, uh, have been having a push those last two years or this last year, uh, which is really impressive. And for most industry experts, we hadn't seen nothing. We are just at the beginning of that. So those three technologies, the internet, RFID, mobile, are changing the way we can create new services. But in the same time, and especially in Europe, where we have been discussing that a lot during that semester with the French presidency of the European Union, um, obviously uh, the number of devices and the way they can be connected one with the others um, are creating new opportunities to trace people in a way that was simply impossible before. Trace people and their activities, trace people and their actions around the environment of um, their daily lives, 
but also ideas, creation, work. Basically, everything we do now could have, if the Internet of Things is set to be developed in the next few years, everything we do could have a, a, a trace, a footprint on the Internet in the short term. That is a, a possibility and that is also a risk. A risk that some people would, even more than now, say, we don't want to be traced, we want to be let alone, we don't want to use those technologies. We, already in the developed country, we notice that there is a, a small margin of people who are totally able to use those technologies, who have the means, who have the revenues, the, uh, the education, but don't want to. And uh, that proportion could change if they have the impression that this network, like often these days the social networks are described, uh, this network could go against the, the best interest of the people which it's supposed to serve. And at this moment, the spread of billions of RFID chips following each and every action, revealing each and any possession of a book, of a drug, of a religious item, of anything that could uh, create a, a close link between a person and its orient political, philosophical, re religious uh, orientation or, uh, or origin, could have a tremendous impact in terms of public policy. Why? Because uh, that could create the conditions for a massive backlash. A massive backlash in which the citizen would say, that network is too dangerous, we don't use it. For that, there has been a lot of reflections on what could be the political and technical ways to prevent that scenario to happen. And precisely the names of those technology, the name of those technology is often uh, resumed as, or summed as um, PET. PET for Privacy Enhancing Technologies. At this moment, let's go back to, tech, to, to the technical root of the problem. At this moment, the RFID chips exist in many flavors. Some are very simple, purely passive, made basically from a chip and an antenna, meaning having no mob mobile parts and no energy sources, meaning that they are virtually immortal. They can uh, outlive or outlast generations of users. So what it means is when they are spread, Basically, we can do nothing. That is the current way the basic part of the RFID chips are made. Some are much more complicated. Some have their own energy sources, so they become mortal. Some have their own um, way to uh, activate themselves. Some um, have sensors inside um, and many other devices. So. The question is what kind of chips, what kind of, what kind of uses, and what kind of ways for the people, for the citizens, to interact with them, with those chips. So the question is do we need to change the architecture of those chips to be sure that the citizens will be able to mute or to silence those chips? That's a an important question before those chips are largely deployed in the, uh, in the realm of the citizens. Because at this moment, most of those chips are used for logistics, for traceability, and they are not used after by the citizen himself. When they are becoming used for creating new services, we have to be sure, and that has been the discussion between the European countries recently, we have to be sure that the citizens will be able 
to interact in a way that has to be defined by the industry, by the key players, by the stakeholders of that community, in a way that makes people certain that those chips will not talk without the consent of the person. That precisely as a name, it's called the right to the silence of the chips. It, it sounds poetic, but it, uh, it, it covers a reality which is far from being poetic. But basically, that's the first implementation of a global view on privacy enhancing technologies. We need to be sure that mobile devices, for example, but it, it, it's, not, it's not sure that they will be at the, cen at the center of those technologies, but many people uh, have that in mind, could be able to read, but also to interact and to silence those chips if the need arises. The scenario we have been uh, um, following those last months is that we have chips that are used for logistics. Then there is, for goods, merchandise, a point of sale. And then the citizen, the customer, which is also a citizen, uh, takes that object and we consider that at this moment, at the point of sale, there should be a de deactivation. Then, after, if the person wants to, the possibility of reactivating those objects. At this moment, it, it exactly reproduces the system we Europeans use for opt-in, opt-out, meaning that for the retention of data, we consider that the citizen must give its explicit view on what data he wants and what data he doesn't want to be, to be stored or, or, or to be recorded. That's precisely the same for objects. The same rights, the same basic principles must apply when it comes to taking an object and saying, we want this object to work in that sector, in that field, and not in that. What, what does it change? It changes the fact that we need chips that are deactivable. And currently, very few are. What the industry has been saying to us recently is the fact that in one or two years at most, the price will drop enough for those chips to be globally at the same price as the classic passive chips. That will change a lot because at that moment, we will be able to implement that kind of privacy protection, that, that kind of privacy enhancing technology. And again about the principles. There has been three principles quoted by the European Union during the WISIS, during the, the works of the uh, United Nations Summit on Information Society, uh, which are essential. First, neutrality. Neutrality of the Internet. Most of you know that it has been a, an intense and huge debate in the US. But for the first time, Europe has been saying that neutrality must be protected. But not only neutrality, also interoperability and openness. Those three characteristics of the architecture of the network, has, they have to be protected. Why? Because they, in a way, like my old friend and colleague Larry Lessig has been saying many times, they, in a way, are the foundation, the constitution, with a large C, a capital C, uh, the constitution of the network. So. If we change those three principles, if the network in the future is not neutral, is not interoperable the way it is now, allowing people to create application services from the edges of the network, um, and if it's not open in the way it is, then we could have a network. Maybe it wouldn't be, and I have to ask Bob Kahn's opinion about that, Maybe, but it couldn't be the Internet as we know it. Do we want the Internet to stay, whatever the technologies are, even if it's with objects, with mobile devices, using new system for uh, transmission, 
uh, creating new services? Do we want it to be the, the social and innovative tool it has been for the last few years, the, val the value creation tool that it has been? Or do we want it to go back to the very old networks that existed before the internet, meaning centralized network, highly and tightly controlled network, that is a question we have to solve together. For us, uh, the European uh, countries, the, the, the governments has been saying, we want the internet to stay on its principle, what it is, even if those evolution of the Internet of Things, the evolution that could uh, create uh, ubiquitous computing, as our Japanese colleagues say, um, that is a matter of technology, and those technology will be deployed and used and uh, created by industry, research, academia. But basically, we have to, be, to take a, a stand on what we consider essential for the social, political, and economical lives of the citizens in the future. And that's precisely what we have been trying to say and trying to do during those last months, uh, trying to make sure that those evolution will not be a step backward. And that's precisely the, the objectives of the works of the, the labs and the uh, organization and the, 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 the uh, and the corporations that are working in that field. And I will be happy, if we have the time for that, to uh, tell you more about those works we have been doing in that field, because basically we think Europe as a key opportunity, as one of the major regions in the uh, mobile uh, industry, having more than 100 million users of the uh, 3G uh, high-speed uh, mobile phones, more than 500 million uh, subscribers in the entire Europe uh, of mobile phones. So basically, we are ideally placed to become one of those key regions. Also, we are historically ideally placed to say that the principle and the values that most European citizens share are to be protected, including in those new networks with that Internet of Things. Thank you very much. Thank you, <clears throat> Thank you Bernard. I think that's a very, uh, very serious issue for the future of the Internet of Things because that's not really technical. It's something that much less, much less easy to uh, understand and anticipate instead of, uh, as opposed to technical matters. Now, the next uh, uh, contributor will be Francis Muguet. Again. It's a short but a little provocative at time and in middle ground between the technical presentation of Dr. Kahn and the more general consideration of Bernard Benamou. So, the problem is what we are dealing with. So I believe that is really not exactly the Internet of Things, but the network of things. A very restrictive interpretation of is that the Internet of Things is only an Internet between things. And, but in the mind, I will say, of the general public and the, most of the people here, I think it's not only this case. It's the inter interaction between the humans and, in fact, the machines. So, in fact, if we broaden this interpretation, because you look, for example, in Wikipedia, the Internet of Things is really the Internet between things. So there is two components. There is the man to machine to machine, what is called the M2M, which is a communication between machines, whether they are owned by individuals or companies, institutions, governments, and the machine to human. And this includes the persuasive computing the ubiquitous computing, which is, in fact, just a way to have a better human-computer interaction. And the way the, these two components are evolving are quite different, because one is limited to the number of humans, of course, and the other one 
will be limit, not quite, almost unlimited. It will be limited to the number of sensors, the number of machines where each human can be surrounded with. And also the legal aspects are quite different. And I insist this is really an interdisciplinary as, uh, pro, uh, area and the legal aspects are very important. You want to defend privacy because the only way to defend privacy is the law and there is no other way. So we need, to, then, so this way I think is a way to present to, to approach this. Because I've been concerned about how to deal with this nascent topic. So I'm proposing some kind of an approach. Maybe there is many other. So one is to, to deal with, in fact, the concern areas. They are the commerce industry, they are the consumers, and I put violet because this is really a cons the, uh, uh, something what the consumer is aware of because they are buying it. But there are many others. We are going back to these questions. The else. This is tremendously important. And also, what has been used also is for the protection and monitoring. anti theft you know, to, to fend off the, the burglars, but also national security. And when I've seen the terrorist accident, uh, incidents, I will say, in Mumbai, this is a serious question. Now, when you have this, um, anyway, this, uh, this, um, first, um, I will say, um, row of this matrix, you have a row in different uh, dimension, there, there, there is what I call the transversal steam, the seam. So there is, what's, what is important is about the network efficiency. Is this network is going to work? The network security, the economy, the privacy, because it's cost a lot, then it will never be implemented. There's a question of a democracy. If this network could be used, in fact, as a to enhance democracy or, in fact, to prevent it. And, in fact, the way about this governance. We are in Internet Governance Forum, so we shall deal about the governance of this nascent area. So the list is not exhaustive. It's just a way to, in fact, to approach these complex problems. So just to take the example of industry and commerce, which is one of the fields where it has been first implemented. But we are going to see that, in fact, it is implemented already, and the people are simply not aware of it. One idea is just to make a direct mapping into the IPv6 address space. It is huge, but whenever you have, in fact, gave to an object an IP address, and you change it, or will you remove it? Okay. So there is the question of flexibility, but it is a distinct, in fact, possibility. There is the object naming services, and this I'm going to explain a little bit because, in fact, it depends on the audience. Some people know, and people doesn't know it works. So, for example, you have a, I just put a name, a number, and this system simply works onto going on t only on two domain names, actually. I, before it was just only one, onapc.com and onapc.eu. So in fact, what you have, and for governance issue is quite interesting, they are using the DNS system, but they are not using the namespace only for two domain names. They are building their own namespace on the secondary namespace. The secondary namespace of this on SPC, one is managed especially in an estate by VeriSign, and the other one, in fact, through the, I will say, the political fight of uh, Bernard and uh, of his colleague, in fact, is managed uh, in the EU, there is a rule, by Orange Business Services. There has been also recently, in Nice, a proposal made by Bertrand Vielle of .ons new GTLD. So in that case, it will be a completely, it will go back to assist, not to a variety of domain names. Also, there is a dedicated DNS class according to my proposal, the Net4D proposal. There has been a presentation on this and other workshops, so I'm not going to repeat this. And there is the system of Bobcat. Okay. 
So now look into the network security. All DNS-based proposal security is based on DNSSEC, and the DNSSEC raise serious problems. The deployment is quite slow and quite problematic. The Android system on the hands end has been designed to be secure from scratch. So an engineering starting point, whenever you have designed something which is not secure, and so you try to make it secure, well, well, I think you, there is a problem. And the Android system in, on, this, on, this, on this aspect is, I believe, from the engineering starting point of network security, much better. So the economy, as this has been useful to use in the industry of the RFID and so forth, yes. In the manufacture of goods to lower the inventory, yes. And, um, but the problem is, in fact, reading the RFID. If it is not 100% efficient, then in fact, if it is only 99% efficient, and it, then in fact you have the risk that some goods, in fact, are ignored and even if it's stolen. So there is an improvement with reading with several frequencies at the same time, but still it cannot be relied exclusively. Uh, so there is the problem of privacy, what's going on privacy with industry, and, and the governance. So we are going back to an important issue. The dot ONS, new GTL, will, should, will be operated under ICANN control by a registry to be determined. And I bet, I don't know, I may bet that some people will try to make such a proposal. We are going to see, it will be quite interesting. The ONS is under the control of EPC Global, so we have a representative here. And the Andal space, specific to NetNX things, always the Net4D DNS class could be managed by a multi stakeholder entities to be determined. And you may ask, in fact, Bob Khan about the governance of the Andal system. It can answer to you much better. And um, one aspect is that probably, probably because there is a huge legacy uh, problem that maybe DNS-based solution may be tolerated for M2 human, machine to human, whenever security requirement are not essential. But whenever the security requirement are essential, then it's better to use a system that's been designed from scratch to be secure. So now I'm going back because to, to keep, because a few slides I'm missing. For the problem of else. In fact, no, the problem of the consumers. Bernard, I say that the people can silence their ships and everything. The problem is that sometimes they are not be able to do that. For example, in France, Every day, millions of people are using the Navigo Pass. Okay, it turns out that in this Navigo Pass, you have, in fact, all your personal information. Those are people who will be able to prevent, in fact, not to use this question. Otherwise, you could not enter the subway. So now they have been removing the carte orange. So the only way to have some kind of uh, way to get it is to go the Navigo Pass. And the only way to have a Navigo Pass without personal information is to get the Navigo Pass for tourists. And in fact, the police in France has been using the Navigo Pass to retrieve information and in fact to arrest, uh, in fact, uh, bad people. I hope not to follow good people. Okay, but this, we never know. So, for example, in a ski resort, it's something less dangerous, but okay. Whenever you're on the freeway, you're using uh, also RFID. So the problem is that the people are already using RFID, they are using RFID in the internet of things, but they don't know. So the backlash is not whenever this is going to be implemented, but when it's going to be revealed. This is quite different. Now there is an interesting thing, this is the, for the consumers, is that now there are people and Violet is a French company quite interesting there. Uh, in fact, selling tags, and you put can tags with your own object in your house, so that, in fact, you have an interaction with your computer. And this has been a odd selling product. I bought myself one. And anyway, for some uh, people who are technologic savvy, of course, but 
as, at least the response has been surprisingly good for this type of um, application. And there are many more, in fact, many more which are on the way. Startups were created to use this type of operation for the consumer market. Now for the else. The else is another topic. Do you want to have your data to be known? Yes or not? Whenever you have an allergy or some kind of a blood, blood type, a rare one or something like that, well, you better eat no. For example, personally, I have an allergy to, to a radiographic, I don't re even remember the name of it, but I almost died when they put it in, into me. So I better the people to know. And in fact, if they find out because of this relatively raw energy, I don't care. I prefer maybe to be traced off, maybe to die for some strange reason. 